Well, good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today at Heritage Events Live. My name is Tom Spohr, and together with my co-moderator, Ed Hazelmeyer, we'd like to welcome you to today's event, the fight to get a COVID-19 vaccine, the inside story of the administration's Operation Warp Speed. By way of introduction, Operation Warp Speed's goal is to produce and deliver over 300 million doses of safe and effective vaccines with the initial doses available by January, 2021. We have a great program in store for you and we wanna get right to it. So let's do that. With that, I'm delighted to tell you a little bit about our first speaker, General Gustave or Gus Perna, is an Army four-star general confirmed by the Senate on July the 2nd to serve as the Chief Operating Officer of Operation Warp Speed. Prior to this assignment, General Perna served as the Commanding General of the Army's Materiel Command for nearly four years, leading 190,000 military, civilian, and contractor employees with the mission to provide logistics, sustainment, and maintenance for a globally deployed Army. General Perna is a career logistician who has led complex supply, distribution, and maintenance operations in multiple combat tours with Army and Joint Forces, and has served at the national level, supporting Department of Defense supply and distribution efforts. Well, as this, as his background, it's easy to see why he was selected for this critically important position. General Perna graduated from the Valley Forge Military Academy and has a master's degree in logistics from the Florida Institute of Technology. General Perna is gonna provide some introductory comments and then he's gonna be followed by Dr. Hepburn, the head of vaccine development. Following Dr. Hepburn, General Perna is gonna come back specifically to talk about vaccine distribution and then we're gonna move into a question and answer period with Ed and I asking questions. And then uh, after a bit, we'll turn to your audience questions. And that's what makes it so important that you enter your questions at the, at, the, at the right block on the platform so we can get to your questions. That's our plan. And General Perna, I now turn the floor over to you, sir. Hey, sir, thank you for that uh, very gracious welcome. Uh, and it's a real honor for myself and Dr. Matt Hepburn to be here. Uh, and talk to the Heritage Foundation um, uh, group. So, you know, first and foremost, it's just an honor to co-lead this task force with, as you said, the mission to develop, manufacture, uh, and deliver uh, safe and effective vaccines, vaccines to the American people. Uh, first and foremost, though, I just want to highlight, this is a whole of America approach. Um, and in that light, I would be remiss um, if I did not um, uh, introduce uh, to the conversation here my other co-lead, because without him, without all that he brings to the table, without his leadership and direction, uh, we would not be successful. And that individual is Dr. Monsef Salawi, uh, truly uh, a co-leader with me. Uh, he serves as a chief science advisor uh, and every day I learn from him and I am at awe uh, at what he brings uh, to uh, the, the task force here. Uh, his efforts, um, tireless, uh, as demonstrated uh, by the progress we made, uh, are really going to make a difference for us. And in my opinion, uh, will uh, deserve, deserves the most credit for our success. With that, I said, though, this is a whole of America approach, um, and we will exceed because of the unparalleled expertise of health and human services uh, scientists um, and logisticians, Department of Defense planning and logistics capability, uh, as well as American industry ingenuity uh, and the innovation from the academia. It's this collective effort uh, that will really uh, ensure we're successful in our end state, uh, and I'm proud to be a part of it. I'd like you to think of it this way. Our world's best scientists and doctors working besides the world's best military uh, with the support of American industry and academia, that is operational warp speed. Um, and we are really proud to be working together in this collective team uh, to drive towards the solution of safe and effective vaccine for the American people. And I am very confident that we are going to be successful to this end. 
Uh, and today we'd like to talk to you a little bit about our approach uh, and where we're at to this um, to this Herculean task uh, that we've been working on for the last four to five months. Uh, and we are really just at the brink of um, finally seeing the fruits of our labor. So more to follow from me, uh, but I turn it back over to you, General Spore. Great, General Perna, thank you so much. Uh, Ed, why don't you take it from here? Thank you. Um, if I could introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Hepburn, he has a uh, undergraduate degree and his medical degree from Duke University and a 23 year career in the United States Army. And in that career, he has had extensive experience in developing vaccines and therapeutic solutions, uh, particularly against current and future uh, potential biologic threats, uh, including uh, serving as director of medical preparedness on the White House National Security Staff from 2010 to 2013, uh, also serving as clinical research director for the U.S. Army's Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases from 2007 to 2009. So he comes to his current position as the uh, vaccine development lead for Operation Warp Speed with quite a depth of experience in this area. Dr. Hepburn, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it is uh, just a privilege to be here and certainly uh, looking forward to answering the questions uh, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get there soon. Um, I want to limit my comments actually to the probably the most important question or at least the question that I receive most often, whether it's at uh, my daughter texting me from college or uh, all of the, these different um, uh, public meetings that we've had and communications over the last six months or so. And the simple question is, how can you achieve the impossible? How can you take a vaccine development process that typically can take five years, eight years, 10 years uh, and truncate that um, into the timelines of Operation Warp Speed? Um, I want to basically put my answer into four categories, and hopefully I can uh, convince you uh, that number one, we've made incredible progress so far, um, but that we can meet the ambitious challenge of Operation Warp Speed. So there's four categories of how we do it. The first is in terms of vaccine technology. I think it's very helpful to point out that uh, the efforts that have gone on for decades in terms of developing vaccines. We stand on the shoulders of giants, of the people that worked on polio, measles, the smallpox eradication campaign, all of that that we learned in terms of how to develop vaccines. And there's been massive progress even before we started Operation Warp Speed in terms of how you can accelerate vaccine development. There's been investments. This is a key point that does science and technology's investments pay off? It certainly does. These are investments that had been made uh, by Health and Human Services with the National Institute of Health. And actually, I'm very proud of DOD investments, uh, especially at DARPA, but elsewhere. Um, investments that said, how can we make vaccines uh, at record time? How can we accelerate, especially the early technologies process? And these investments were used for Ebola. Um, in the Ebola vaccine development processes, and now I feel like they're really paying off. That's how we're in phase three clinical trials now, because of decisions that were, because of those investments and those technologies that, uh, were, that were started in the spring um, that are now really paying off, both for their ability to uh, be developed quickly and prove that they work in animal models, but also that they can be manufactured at a very large scale. The second point is, is in terms of manufacturing. Um, we've talked about this a lot publicly, but I wanna highlight uh, not just one point, but two. Typically what we highlight is, instead of doing the typical parallel process of vaccine product development, where you do a clinical trial and then you decide to manufacture at a larger scale than another clinical trial, then larger scale, that we've run these processes in parallel and really made investments um, where uh, large amounts of vaccines are being made much sooner. 
Now, it is possible that some of those vaccines, if they turn out not to work, that we won't use those doses. Um, but by those investments, we're able to have millions of doses available much sooner than we ever would. But I think the second part that doesn't get highlighted as much is really the beauty of bringing together the best of the Department of Defense and Health and Human Services. By bringing the, uh, as we talked about in the introduction, the supply and logistic expertise of a globally deployed force and applying that to the critical supply chain issues and potentially critical shortages in vaccine manufacturing, critical equipment being delivered months earlier than it otherwise would, that has massively accelerated our vaccine manufacturing timelines. The third is in the space of clinical trials, and I want to foot stomp on this a little bit um, because I think everybody hopefully has been tracking that uh, both the AstraZeneca and the Janssen clinical trials have been given the green light uh, they, to proceed uh, from the Food and Drug Administration. Um, both of those products had been on a safety pause, and that safety pause, uh, emphasis, that safety pause has now been withdrawn, um, but it also emphasizes very much that the prioritization that we have safe and effective vaccines, that we are following the highest ethical standards to ensure that these vaccines are safe and that those clinical trials are conducted to the highest regulatory and ethical standards as well. So our Janssen and AstraZeneca vaccines are back on track. Um, these are not small clinical trials. Again, in a typical product development, you may see a vaccine trial of, let's say, 5,000 volunteers or maybe 8,000 volunteers. Our standard has been 30,000 volunteers in our clinical trials. That's because we want to gather as much safety information as we possibly can. And we also want to know if they work. With the more people you enroll, the sooner you're going to be able to evaluate the effectiveness. What we've done so far, and I think, again, most of you have probably tracked this, that Moderna has now completed their phase three clinical trial in terms of 30,000 patients or 30,000 volunteers enrolled. Um, Pfizer um, is still enrolling, but they're above 40,000 volunteers now. What that shows you, for me, and, and I, I don't know if this message is appreciated, but uh, I want to emphasize it, is that that shows me that over 60,000 Americans have decided to say, I will volunteer. I don't know if I'm going to receive the vaccine or I may receive a, a placebo, uh, but that I'm going to do my part in fighting this pandemic. I think we feel uh, extraordinary appreciation for those volunteers. Um, and But today, uh, as I mentioned, the Janssen and AstraZeneca trials are going to need another many thousand volunteers for each one. So we're hoping that we can send the message through the, the participants in this meeting of the importance in volunteering uh, for vaccine clinical trials and to encourage, um, encourage those. We, we're, we're very proud of that spirit of volunteerism that we see in America. We also always emphasize it, the word volunteer means it is a personal choice. And no one is ever, uh, everyone makes that choice individually. But we think this venue and many others are great opportunities to strongly encourage uh, people to look into that opportunity. Let me give you one more specific example. Um, for our Janssen clinical trial, we're having multiple sites in our VA medical centers that will be enrolling. And for, for our nation's veterans, this is another way that they can continue to serve in this way, uh, fighting the, vent, the pandemic as a volunteer. My final point of those four on how we can achieve the impossible is through teamwork. I think your, this session uh, is called fighting the pandemic. We're fighting the virus, and the way we fight the virus is really getting the best from all of us. I think what we've seen is extraordinary integration and cooperation between our Department of Defense and our Health and Human Services. It's, it's that the, the best that our government has to offer. But when Do, uh, General Perna mentions the, the whole of nation, 
all of us fighting this together, the public, the public sector, the private sector, the foundations, um, everybody all together fighting that virus. Um, I've seen some of the best teamwork that I've ever been a part of as part of Operation Warp Speed, and it is the essential fourth ingredient on how we achieve the impossible. Thank you. Dr. Hepburn, thank you so much for that. I'm now going to invite uh, General Perna to come back and make some very specific remarks regarding uh, vaccine distribution. Over to you, sir. Hey, thanks, sir. Uh, I really, what a powerful uh, update by Dr. Hepburn. It's a great teammate uh, <laughs> that I have just been uh, really blessed to work with uh, over the last five months. So, uh, Matt, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I'd like to touch up, I'd like to quickly hit where. Uh, Dr. Hepburn uh, talked about manufacturing. I know it's not lost on anybody listening to this conversation, uh, but in order to really uh, take the risk in manufacturing, we had to do a lot of things uh, uh, parallel. Uh, he described, I thought, incredibly well the risk that we took in that, you know, we proceeded with uh, six vaccines while simultaneously uh, implementing the manufacturing capacity that was required to meet our, our, our mission. So just simply said, right, we had to make sure um, that we had the right capacity to manufacture the vaccine, which we didn't have five months ago. So we have done, we have added, actually added brick and mortar capacity. In other words, we have built facilities from the ground up to produce and fill finish vaccine. We have uh, garnered all the materials required to produce the six vaccines, right? Not only to execute uh, trial uh, trials, but also to bring it up to scale and full manufacturing for uh, eventual distribution to the American people. Uh, and then we had to accumulate the right equipment um, for all the manufacturing uh, that we've put together um, and then the last stage of that was making sure we had the right workforce that was trained and ready to, to uh, produce um, and actually manufacture uh, and fill finish the vaccine. So really a remarkable task on its own. Uh, in this effort, what we did is we did implement the Defense Pro Production Act authorities, um, you know, with OWS uh, through the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Secretary of Defense. To date, we've implemented 12 um, uh, with industry and we're working eight more. So it is um, this effort that has allowed us to um, uh, prioritize contracts, prioritize materials, um, authorize uh, control of uh, scarce and critical materials uh, and then drive industry to expand production and supply resources, which I think will be uh, at the end of the day, uh, really critical to our overall success. Um, we've received nothing but absolute support in this light, whether it was uh, permission from hire to do so uh, uh, and or the execution by our industry partners um, uh, to do day-to-day -day business. So really remarkable effort collectively by, again, uh, the whole of America highlighted uh, particularly in this part by industry. So uh, let's, let's assume that we're going to have vaccine available, um, you know, where science will drive uh, the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine, as Dr. Hepburn talked about. Uh, let's assume that we have quantities of vaccine available to go upon FDA approval of an EUA. What is next, right? It goes without saying, but it will be the distribution of vaccine across all of America um, to include uh, territories uh, and major cities, large metropolitan areas, um, and it's just a Herculean task all on its own. So, you know, what do we do? We, we thought through the process, there was many courses of action, but at the end of the day, I made the decision that we were going to utilize the commercial industry 
that was most capable of uh, implementing this task, right? And so there was three large companies, all capable. All three of them are playing a role in vaccine distribution as well as therapeutic distribution. But the primary um, industry partner for distribution will be McKesson. Uh, and McKesson is well versed on how to do this. Uh, at the end of the day, I chose it because they know how to do it. They have experience doing it. To uh, at the end of it, we want to be able to transition to them down the road for routine uh, effort. Uh, and then third, and, and most importantly, is that uh, the states are very comfortable with uh, dealing with the commercial industry. Uh, as we do all sorts of vaccines and therapeutics throughout the year accordingly. Um, and so, uh, uh, in fact, I just left, Dr. Slowey and I were visiting with McKesson uh, yesterday down in Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, and we got to see firsthand a brand new uh, distribution warehouse uh, that's included uh, freezers uh, that can go down to minus 80 and minus 20. Uh, and then have the facilities to really distribute across to America. The McKesson will partner with FedEx um, and with UPS for distribution, not only CONUS, but around the world, um, as well as local pharma, uh, Walmart, CBS, um, uh, Walgreens, Kroger's, et cetera, um, to ensure that distribution can reach everybody. Um, four tenets of the distribution strategy that I gave the team as we were working planning was first and foremost, we needed to understand, we need that visibility and control of all vaccines. We need to know where every vial was, whether it was in the uh, factory or it was on a truck or it had been distributed down to administration site. We must have 100% accountability of all vaccines uh, uh, every day. Second, we must be able to track the uptake of vaccine um, to persons out in, in America. Two reasons for this. First and foremost, um, because there, the five of the six are two-dose vaccines, we need to make sure that people are registered to the vaccine that they were administered uh, and that there is uh, fail-safe checking checks and balances to make sure when they come back 21 or 28 days later uh, that they get the right vaccine uh, for their second dose. The second point was is we want to manage the flow of vaccine to the American people. Initially, uh, we're going to have tens of millions of doses available come December. Uh, but come January, February, March, it will quickly uh, and exponentially increase the hundreds of millions of doses. Uh, so it'll be essential that we maintain the right flow of uh, vaccine to the American people. So tracking the uptake. Uh, third, we must make sure uh, that we have traceability of the vaccine uh, and that we know uh, we're where the vaccine is going at all times. Um, it'll be a hot commodity, of course, and we needed to get to the places um, where it'll be distributed uh, based on state priorities uh, and requirements uh, in accordance with the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. And then last, we want to be able to cover all parts of America, whether you're in the uh, Pacific in the remote islands uh, uh, in the Pacific or down in the, you know, uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, we want to be able to get to those islands. We want to be able to get to all of uh, CONUS America, whether it's in the metropolitan cities or rural America. Uh, and we want to be able to make sure we can distribute to those American citizens who are overseas you know, serving in the Department of Defense or State Department, et cetera. So we had to have coverage. Uh, those were the four major tenets for our planning. The last thing I'll leave you with uh, before I turn it back over for questions. Um, this is different uh, as we distribute this vaccine than the normal routine execution of something like influenza vaccine. 
Um, the distribution of influenza vaccine on an annual basis is a pull method. In other words, uh, pharma farm, pharmacies, doctor's offices, hospitals will uh, register and request certain amounts of vaccine uh, and it will be delivered to them directly by industry. What we've done since we have purchased these doses from, from industry, what we're going to do is push, right? We are going to allocate equitably uh, vaccine doses to all of America simultaneously. And as doses become available, we're pushing down and out to uh, the United States of America. Uh, eventually, this will transition to a poll, uh, but probably not likely any earlier than March, April timeframe. Uh, and so, uh, we must ensure that we have uh, very intricate uh, and intricate um, distribution process um, to meet the four tenets as I described, uh, be able to uh, ensure the constant flow of vaccine as it's available, uh, and then make sure that everybody gets the right vaccine at the right time. So that concludes my comments, and I uh, am really grateful and welcome to any questions that you might have. Over. Oh, great, General Perna, that was uh, that was awesome. General Huffburn, also, thank you so much. Uh, we're now going to go to some questions from Ed and I, but the questions are also rolling in uh, from the audience, so we're going to quickly cut to those, and uh, but we're just going to ask a couple to get things warmed up. And so uh, my first question. Uh, is to you, General Perna, and it's uh, you're a humble man, I know, and you don't like uh, talking about yourself, frankly. But this is really a, a personal kind of question. Uh, you were you were weeks away from retiring from the Army after a uh, distinguished 39-year uh, career, Army career, when you got a call uh, from the President that he wanted you to help lead Operation Warp Speed. And you know, I'm guessing many of the listeners on this webinar might face a similar kind of moment when they're unexpectedly hit with a new task, a new mission that they uh, they probably never in their wildest dreams expected to face, and they had to pivot uh, to a new environment, a new set of challenges. I know they'd love to hear from you. You know, you know how did you get this news? How did you get your head around this new mission? And and how, how did you prioritize what you had to do first in this new immense mission that you were given? Thank you. Yeah, so, sir, what, what a great question. And I still remember, you know, we all have those moments where you know exactly where you were when the phone rang. <laughs> I know exactly where I was. Um, and Susan and I were transitioning uh, into our, uh, at the time, thought retirement home. Uh, it was a weekend. Uh, it was about a week before the announcement by the president um, in the Rose Garden. Uh, and I was asked, uh, to, um, you know, if I would be interested. Of course, um, immediately, uh, without hesitation, uh, with full support by Susan, who, oh, by the way, was sitting right next to me uh, when I got the call, uh, you know, it was an immediate yes, I am honored and humbled to do so, uh, and quite frankly, greatly privileged to co-lead uh, this effort with Dr. Monsef Salawi, who is just, as I said earlier, a remarkable leader and scientist. Um, you know, uh, quickly, uh, and, and people who know me and, and read the bio can speculate uh, why I was picked uh, primarily uh, probably to uh, enable manufacturing distribution, um, but uh, it is also about the collective leadership and experiences of you know all the years I've served, um, and so uh, I would tell you that my uh, experiences uh, have, have really contributed to what I've done. My instincts that I've developed over the years have enabled uh, and supported decision making. Um, but in partnership with uh, Dr. Salawi, we've been able to really just put um, really numerous pieces together. Um, uh, simultaneously uh, understanding, really teaching each other. Uh, and as Matt Hepburn said, um, what I'm finding them to be most rewarding, you know, I, I've really been proud of working for what I've always called.
called the team of teams, the United States Army. But as Matt Hepburn said, I have never, ever worked with a greater collective group of professionals, whether they're scientists, doctors, um, uh, 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 military persons, um, industry and really academia. That's why it is so exciting to do what I'm doing. Uh, and then at the end of the day, uh, sir, and I know you know this, uh, but it's just a calling, right? And, um, you know, this is about saving uh, American lives. And for me, it is a focused effort to do so. Uh, and it is this great collaborative effort Egos are checked at the door, uh, and we are working this together to an end state that will bring um, America uh, back to a healthy state. So thanks for that question. I probably underestimated the impact uh, if Susan's listening, um, but I really appreciate her support in case she is listening. <laughs> so thanks, sir. <laughs> Ed, why don't you go ahead with a question? Yeah, I would. Uh, thank you. I I've been scrolling through the ones that from our audience. So, uh, and some folks have questions that are very similar to the ones that are on my mind. Dr. Hepper, and I'd like to ask you a couple of things that really is very much in the forefront, not only of our listeners on this, but the general public, and that is some of the safety issues around here. I think one of the things that's gotten um, overlooked maybe, and you sort of touched on it in your remarks, is that what most people are used to in terms of vaccines that they got as children or flu vaccines or things like that is uh, different now. We have very different technologies, and some of these are new technologies that are really being uh, applied for the first time uh, in vaccine development, such as messenger RNA. And I would like, uh, if possible, for you to address the concerns that people have, gee, I got an infection from a vaccine or something like that. Would, you know, what are those concerns um, uh, relative to these new vaccines? How, how's the safety profile? Yeah, so, so first of all, thank you for the question. And I think um, the, uh, but probably make a couple points and happy to elaborate further. I think um, I want to actually go back to one of my previous comments in terms of volunteers and in terms of clinical trials. I think maybe most people understand, but but to, but to state it clearly that uh, with with every every vaccine that's been administered as part of Operation Warp Speed, it's done in the context of a clinical trial. What that starts with is that someone makes that individual decision and says, I'm willing uh, to sign up. As part of that process, we explain the risks and the potential benefits in detail, but we also acknowledge that we don't know everything there is to know uh, about these vaccines. Um, it really, again, goes back to that spirit of volunteerism. We appreciate people that are willing to do that um, as, part of this pro as part of developing these vaccines. Uh, but what we also do um, for their willingness to volunteer is we monitor them extremely closely to make sure that they're not having side effects and to make sure we're truly understanding um, the impact of these vaccines. Um, so when we, t when we say 30,000 patients, what we're talking about, or 30,000 volunteers, we're saying that 15,000 of those volunteers have received a placebo, but 15,000 uh, volunteers have already received these vaccines, and we're watching them literally on a daily basis um, to say, how uh, are the vaccines going okay? Are we seeing side effects from them or not? So I think that that's the first point, is that that safety standard, and then, and then all of that information is packaged, processed, and ultimately presented to the Food and Drug Administration for an independent, and I say again, independent, uh, evaluation um, to make sure that these vaccines are safe. Um, the second point is, is in terms of uh, new technologies um, and, and vaccine, sort of vaccine technologies in general. 
um, that we have been, uh, as I previously mentioned and as you mentioned, sir, um, that there are tr very traditional ways of making vaccines, but we've also seen a lot of progress um, that are accelerating, for, allowing us to make vaccines faster. One of the benefits that we think we're going to see from this is that it also may make these vaccines safer as well. And uh, what we've seen with the products that we've chosen, um, not for COVID-19, but for other pathogens, that these vaccines have been tested in clinical trials and have shown us uh, that they are effective for other pathogens, but also safe. Uh, so the essentially, for each of the vaccines in our portfolio, uh, we've said, okay, uh, have you used this similar technology for an Ebola vaccine or something like that? And we look at the detailed safety profile of every person that received those vaccines, and the safety profiles have looked to be safe so far. Um, ultimately, though, uh, we are not only uh, saying we're looking at these vaccines in the short term for clinical trials. But as part of the regulatory process, the Food and Drug Administration is providing guidance in terms of how will we follow these people out for the longer term. Um, it's called pharmacovigilance. And that's, again, like any other vaccine, we're meeting that highest, uh, that highest standard um, so that the uh, long-term safety uh, will be followed according to regulation. Yeah, and I think that gets at some of the other concerns that we've heard expressed by people, which is that if this whole process, Operation Warp Speed, is pushing things along at a fast pace, then does that imply that corners are being cut, that it may not be saved, et cetera? And I think what is not fully appreciated is, uh, as, as you mentioned, the technologies being used allow for faster uh, uh, mass production than uh, has historically been the case with vaccines, uh, that in some cases, uh, just because of the nature of the technology, there's a somewhat better safety profile. And I think you addressed two things in your comments about the speed. One is that they're taking steps in parallel instead of in sequence. And the risk to that is, well, we may, you know, be paying money for stuff that turns out to not work, but hey, you know, better try five things and wait for one to fail and then try another. Uh, and the other point, though, and I, I want to drill down on that, is the clinical trials. It sounds like, if I'm correct in hearing you, that essentially uh, to expedite the process, you all are, the or the vaccine candidates and, and their sponsors, are doing larger trials than they would normally at this stage. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We uh, we agree with all of your points. And, and if I can just add a couple points, uh, we are not cutting corners on safety. We are not cutting corners on the quality of the manufactured product. Those will be done to the highest standards. And we are not cutting corners in terms of what would be expected from a regulatory authority, the Food and Drug Administration, which I think has the highest standard in the world for medical products, um, we are going to meet those standards. Um, I think it's an important message, uh, and I think we are practicing what we preach. Um, I think one of the things that we would also highlight is that the Food and Drug Administration has published guidelines and has said, here's what we are going to expect for COVID-19. The, the FDA has also had a public meeting last week where they had an open dialogue about here's how we are going to evaluate these products and here's, here's why. Um, we have also, with the products um, in the earlier phases of clinical trials and in their preclinical development, the companies are publishing, uh, publishing their results in peer-reviewed journals. All of this not only is showing that we don't cut corners, but I, I strongly feel this has been an incredibly transparent process so that people will have confidence um, in the vaccines that we are generating. And my second point is, yes, to answer your question, these are large clinical trials. These are clinical trials that are enrolling a lot of volunteers in a short period of time. 
These are clinical trials where our experts and our professionals are working nights and weekends. And um, as you would expect, we're doing that too. Um, but our partners in the private sector that are running these clinical trials are, are working around the clock to get these clinical trials up and running. But it's ultimately driven by, again, those people who've said, uh, you know, again, literally thousands of people who are lining up at the door of the clinical trial site saying, please, I want to do my part and volunteer. And if I could just ask one one very interesting question that came up from one of our viewers here, Tom, uh, that follows on this line, and and that is that uh, there is the probability that there will be, uh, or the possibility that there will be more than one vaccine available at the same time for uh, for COVID. And the obvious question is, well, will people have a choice? And if so, how would they choose which one to take? Uh, and I thought that was a very interesting question. Have you all given some thought to that? We have. Um, you know, not coincidentally, we were actually in a meeting talking about this right before. So, um, and I will say uh, it, it, it will be, there will be some complexity, but God, I hope we have that problem. Um, we, we went into this process, again, doing the impossible uh, with the thought of that we were going to invest in six vaccines um, with the hopes that we would have one uh, vaccine that makes it through all of those typical challenges of medical product development. Um, we still have six that are on track. Uh, we're thrilled that we've made this much progress so far. Um, and uh, but but we are um, working through. I think our our Department of Defense colleagues understand this very well. It's contingency planning. So we have, in all aspects of Operation Warp Speed, have thought about all of the different scenarios and contingency plans. So um, there are scenarios where we might have more than one vaccine uh, that could be useful. Now, we, the, the simple answer to your question is that we're going to let the science uh, drive that process in terms of which vaccines work best uh, for which people, meaning that uh, it, is, it is possible that we may have equivalent efficacy uh, and equivalent safety across the board. Um, we could also be in a scenario where one of our vaccines preferentially works very well in elderly uh, populations that are mo most vulnerable. So we would then uh, pivot our programs so that the vaccine that works best in elderly are given to, to elderly volunteers. Uh, a final point that I'll make is that all, all of our vaccines in our portfolio are two-dose vaccines, um, which as everyone can appreciate adds a lot of complexity. Um, the Janssen vaccine for which we are uh, enrolling, as I mentioned previously, in the clinical trial now um, is a, a one-dose vaccine. And so um, we're, again, thinking through contingency plans as well um, in situ situations where um, if we have a one-dose vaccine, what would be the optimal use of that? Right. And presumably the large uh, uh, studies doing 30,000 in a phase three trial, 30,000 uh, patients, as opposed to say 5,000, as you mentioned earlier, that enables the, uh, the companies, uh, the sponsors and the FDA to get a better handle on some of these issues like uh, differences in age and, and uh, race and other demographic issues. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, that's Talk precisely it. So I think this question, or and I'm going to try and bundle a couple of questions together because we're getting a lot of good ones here. And these, yeah. this is for General Perna. And I was hoping uh, a lot of people have asked about the military's role, you know, in terms of distribution of the vaccine. And they've also asked, um, should, you know, I, I've heard we have an election coming up. Uh, would would a change in administration, how would that affect uh, Operation Warp Speed? Hey, sir, thanks. Um, so real quickly, to answer the, your first question directly, the, the military is providing um, planning, right? We're helping with, uh, you know, things with uh, logistics, augmentation, program support, log cap support. Um, we're running program management um, for them, uh, for the team. 
the, so the, what we're doing is bringing enabling capability uh, and capacity uh, to the fight. There will not be this vision uh, that some people have that there'll be army trucks driving through the streets delivering vaccine. Uh, that, that's not one feasible um, or the right way to do it. You know, th this is the greatest country in the world. We know how to do this. Right, commercial industry knows how to do it, uh, and that's how we're going to do it. Uh, the second uh, point to your question, uh, nope, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're we got our we got our heads down, and we are driving the sled, um, and we are going to uh, execute our mission uh, as directed. And so, I see nothing that would cause us to stop. Uh, doing what we're doing, no matter the results of the election. Break. I would like to highlight, though, again, we talked briefly about the whole of America approach. I, I want everybody to visualize, really, uh, the brilliance of this, uh, of what we're doing here. Uh, and this is not my vision or Dr. Slowey's vision, uh, but really of others who had the foresight and vision to bring the collective uh, team uh, together. Uh, this team is uh, partnered uh, at the highest level by the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Secretary of Defense. Uh, we are a direct report to them. We don't have to go through staffs. We don't have to coordinate time. We are pick up the phone and we have direct and immediate access to these senior uh, uh, secretaries. Two, uh, everything we are doing, right, uh, is from scratch, right? This whole process is from built from the ground up scratch. There was no structure in execution. There was no uh, strategy in execution. There was no training guidance or budget in execution, uh, and all of it had to be brought together simultaneously uh, as we started our effort uh, collectively. So we built the team uh, 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 across, as I talked about, uh, HHS, Department of Defense, industry, academia, by those who we thought could contribute uh, and those who would help us uh, really uh, make the strides necessary to achieve our goal by the end of the year. Uh, and so uh, to that end, um, we really had to, uh, as I said earlier, check egos at the door. You had to come in and no matter what you were a part of before, you had to, uh, one, um, shoulder the burden of responsibility of execution not just uh, 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 of sitting at the end of the table. Two, you had to have the right relationships to uh, garner support in all that we were doing. Uh, and then three, you know, at the end of the day, we're all being he held accountable, you know, to how far we're moving the ball. Uh, we're mildly interested in uh, theory um, or uh, pontification of what could be. Um, we are every single day, all of us, uh, Dr. Slowey, myself, Matt Hepburn, other members of the team, we receive hundreds of emails from people with recommendations. And I got to tell you that some of them are very illuminating and very helpful. Uh, and, and they're welcomed and we're really appreciative that we receive them. Uh, on the other side of that spectrum, though, we get a lot of conversation about uh, everything we're doing and how it's not going to work and how it's not the right way to do it, um, you know, quite frankly, not very helpful. Um, you know, so my thing is, is uh, be a part of the team, help us become successful, understand that this has never, ever been done before. Um, and we have successfully, so far, taken a process that normally takes between five and 10 years, built an extraordinary team, uh, put it all together, and we are uh, successfully driving down the field. Um, so at the end of the day, come be a part of what we're doing. 
come help us do it better, uh, but sitting on the sidelines just poking away is, is not helpful to what we're doing. Over. Great. Thank you very much. Again, I have a lot of questions that I want to get through as many as, as possible. Dr. Hepburn, maybe this is for you. Uh, a couple people have asked, does this, does this effort that you're in now change fundamentally how vaccines are developed in this country? Do Have we moved the goalposts uh, permanently or is this just a thing and are we going to go back to uh, eight to 10 year uh, vaccine development cycles? And then if I could piggyback on that, a couple people asked about the, the really cold temperatures that some of these vaccines uh, may have to be stored at. Could, could one of you talk to what kind of challenges and solutions we have for that situation? Sure. So um, happy to start. Uh, yeah, I, frankly, I find it profoundly exciting to say, to imagine a world uh, post-pandemic where we can rapidly develop treatments, uh, where we can rapidly develop vaccines, um, not only for the new threats uh, that come up that we weren't expecting, uh, but for all of those infections that, that plague us um, as a global community. So, so I do hope we can uh, revolutionize um, vaccine development. I hope we can show people what is possible um, uh, in terms of, of, of how, um, how we can achieve accelerated product development without compromising the, making sure that the vaccines are safe and effective. And I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, uh, Tom, I saw an interesting question here, if I can jump in from one of our uh, uh, listeners. And uh, it was asking about the estimated duration of protection that these vaccine candidates will give. That's one of the uh, open questions is, okay, if it generates a response, how long does that response last? Um, do you have anything you can share with us on that, uh, Dr. Hepburn, or is that just something we have yeah. to wait when we get the clinical trial results. Well, we're uh, we are going to have to wait. Uh, the we're going to have to wait until the clinical trial results. And but the intention is this is why uh, the people that are vaccinated in the clinical trial now, uh, our intention is to follow them for up to two years, so that we can get a better idea on that critically important question of duration of protection. Um, what we are also doing though, and, and again, we're, we are informed by uh, great scientists in the National Institute of Health and in academic collaborations um, that we're watching, we, we don't understand the duration of protection from coronavirus infection itself. So can you get coronavirus again? Um, right. And uh, there's a lot of recent publications that are coming out uh, getting a better characterization of the immune response to coronavirus infection. All of that scientific knowledge is just feeding into our vaccine programs so that we are understanding that, understanding that duration of protection and ultimately that we will design the trials um, and the, the medical research to answer it. Great. Let me... Uh pick up on a question that a couple of people have asked, and that's, and I'm sure you probably have a word for it at Operation Warp Speed, but it's uh, vaccine hesitancy. And so some people reluctant in the best of times to get a vaccine, and, and this might be a bit more than that. What, what are your plans, I guess, going forward to kind of try and attack this problem that uh, this fear or this reluctance people might have to get these vaccines? Yeah, we, we, uh, we, are, we acknowledge we acknowledge, appreciate, um, and uh, acknowledge, appreciate, and we, we've been very kind of thoughtful about uh, this. Is this is that is a much bigger issue than just Operation Warp Speed, but it will certainly impact uh, what we do. Um, from my standpoint, and, and I'll turn it over to General Perna for further comment. From my standpoint, what we've said is it's um, the product development. This is why we don't cut corners. This is why we make sure we maintain the highest ethical quality and regulatory standards and that we're transparent um, throughout the process so that we can create a sense of confidence um, that what we know is being communicated publicly so that people can make the decision uh, about these vaccines, but that again, where you can help us today, everybody on the phone, um, 
conveying that message that we're doing everything we can to assess these vaccines for their safety as well as their efficacy. Hopefully that will inspire confidence that once we show that these vaccines may meet the regulatory standards, uh, that people will be willing to get the shot. General Parnum. Yeah, I, I just would uh, add to that. I have 100% confidence uh, that we have executed to make sure that the vaccines are safe. Uh, and in the development, I feel confident that they'll demonstrate uh, efficacy uh, to, against the uh, virus. Um, in that light, I also have 100% confidence, uh, as Dr. Hepburn alluded to, in what I think is the gold standard for the world, uh, and that's our FDA uh, and their approach to determining whether or not the vaccine is safe and effective. Uh, and um, we will make sure that we will follow the science um, uh, to that end. We will not distribute vaccines that are not determined safe and effective. Um, and you could take my personal word for that um, as well as in, you know, well, just my word. I, I don't want to speak for others. Um, the, 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 what I think about every day when I come into work, quite frankly, um, and just to personalize it for me, right? I think about my uh, 84 year old mother and her husband, right? Uh, I think about my three granddaughters, right? And then of course, um, extended all the way through all my family and friends and everybody I've ever served with over the last um, 39 years, right? That's how I extend myself personally to this effort. Uh, and, you know, nobody in this organization, this task force, is going to allow uh, a vaccine to go out to the, to the American people that is not safe and effective. Um, and it would just be shameful if we get a vaccine out to the American people and people don't take it uh, because um, there, there's doubt or concern. So we're working hard diligently to um, increase confidence uh, in the vaccine. Uh, it, it'll be everybody's individual right to determine whether or not they want the vaccine. Uh, but you know, uh, what we stand behind is the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine that will be delivered to the American people. Over. Great. Uh, one last question that we may go over a bit over the hour, so I'll understand if people have to leave. It's got to do with the actual, uh, I would call it the tactical distribution of the vaccine. The, the who decides between the elderly, the first responders, all those type of things. Where is those lines between the federal government, Operation Warp Speed, and the states and the territories and that. Can you talk about that briefly? Yeah, I think, uh, so I'll, I'll make some initial comments on the product development and scientific side and then hand it over for General Perna in terms of the distribution. I think, you know, we, uh, what we are, we have designed our clinical trials to really assess um, if this vaccine will protect those that are most vulnerable. Um, those, those broad categories are people, the elderly or, or people over 65, and also people with other types of medical conditions. We're ensuring that a large percentage of our clinical trials are enrolling those uh, volunteers um, so that we can under, uh, understand how effective it is. Um, and I hope it will be. So the answer to your question ultimately is that the first step is to really understand how these vaccines perform. Again, we emphasize the science drives the process. Once we understand that, it will go into a prioritization process. And I'll let General Perna comment a little bit more on that. So uh, as uh, Dr. Hepburn really did a great job talking, the science will drive it. It'll be determined um, the safety and the efficacy by the FDA. The CDC uh, will play a role in helping to define uh, based on the FDA findings, the priority and recommendation uh, of, of how the vaccines will be distributed, uh, and then, of course, approved by the Health and Human Services Secretary um, uh, accordingly. Uh, at that time, we'll distribute vaccines uh, accordingly to all of America simultaneously. We will make sure that there is equitable distribution um, in, to, in accordance with that priority. 
uh, and then the states will, you know, they own they own the actual final distribution and administration down to uh, individual arms. Um, and, and, and so really a collective team approach to that effort, over. Yeah, in general, my right. understanding is states have submitted plans to HHS and CDC on the local distribution. Is that correct? Yes, they, they did a remarkable job. They've all submitted plans. We spent uh, about five to seven days reviewing them, providing synopsis, and we returned them uh, yesterday. Um, all weekend teams were working on them and returned them yesterday so that we continually improve, um, you know, our effort to make sure it's done the right way. Over. Right. I mean, get S Secretary Azar to, to uh, disseminate those more broadly. Yeah, that would be helpful. Well, teammates, we have run to the end of our time, although I personally could go another hour or so listening to this great discussion. I want to thank uh, General Perna, Dr. Hepburn, uh, one, for participating today, but in, in more general terms, for your great work on this. I know you're working really long hours, and, and it's not going unnoticed by America. And so thank you so much for joining us today. And I want to, on behalf of Ed and I, thank you for your time today and uh, wish everybody on this call a, uh, a great thing. Uh, General Perna, Dr. Hepburn, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.